Hello. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Warm greetings to all of you. Uh, I'm going to talk about some work we're doing in Ajax uh, Therapeutics, um, a newly public company, by the way, um, on the New York Stock Exchange in the U.S., uh, under the ticker AGE is our ticker symbol. Uh, aging, <laughs> I guess that should be our slogan, no, a aging is us. That's something we're focused on. Um, because we're public, um, I'm required to show you uh, the, the statement I'll be making certain forward-looking statements that have associated risks and uncertainties, and so we refer any uh, investors to our filings with the SEC for more information about the company. All right, so I'm, uh, we're, we're doing several things at Ajax. A Ajax is a sort of a grandchild of several other companies. Uh, Geron, a lot of our intellectual property came from work done at Geron, actually in, mostly in the embryonic stem cell uh, area, uh, and then other companies, um, Advanced Cell Technology and ESL uh, International from Singapore and other places. And a lot of what we do is regenerative medicine, so we use embryonic stem cells as a source of, you know, you, you all know this, right? Embryonic stem cells are a naturally immortal cell. They express telomerase. Uh, and they make cells, well, they, they normally would make babies that are born young, and in the laboratory they make young cells of any kind. And we're focused on two particular cell-based therapies, one for metabolic imbalances in aging, a thing called brown adipocytes, uh, which are lost in aging, and uh, so we replace them as the strategy, and others are vascular-forming cells for the number one cause of mortality uh, in the world, cardiovascular disease. But there's something really cool going on. And for the first time today, I'm going to, to tip the hand a bit about this. It's this program that we've been somewhat cryptic about because we think it's really important. And uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about it today. Uh, we call it uh, induced uh, telomerase and regeneration. I'm going to walk you through some of the sort of the ideological underpinnings of this program, why we think it's important, and where we're at in understanding how this works. So um, let me begin with some basic stuff. Um, one of the things that always occurs to me in these meetings is you're hearing about so many different things. We were just hearing about the hypothalamus and all these things. And it can be confusing. Is it possible that there's a unifying theme? Maybe the aging is more simple than we realized at first glance. Uh, some of uh, my old colleagues are here walking Lignor, I see Jerry Shea. Or they'll remember the early days when we were studying cell aging, the Hayflick limit in the laboratory. Most of the experts in the field felt that the aging of cells in the dish would never be understood. It's too complicated. Meetings like this, people were talking about, well, you know, 43 different molecular pathways that were changed in the aging of cells. Turned out to be quite simple, of course, the absence of the expression of the catalytic component of telomerase. Um, is there a similar unifying theme about to happen in a lot of the other biology of aging? I think so. I'm going to lay out what I think that is. So again, this is sort of elementary. Forgive me if many of you are quite familiar with these ideas, but um, aging is clearly a uniquely somatic cell phenomenon. We're fundamentally two different types of cells, right? The germ line is a lineage of cells. In the case of humans, of course, there's sexual recombination and meiosis and all that. Some species, there's not. It's an immortal lineage of cells that perpetuates the species forever. All of us here in this room are descendants of a lineage of cells that have been proliferating for billions of years. Billions. Uh, as long as life has been on the planet. 
life is able to escape anything like aging. What we experience as aging is a unique phenomenon to a type of cell called the somatic cells that branch out and make the body. And unfortunately, what we normally think of as you and I are somatic cells. Um, so the first thing I would lay out to you is, isn't it interesting to try to understand what's different about the immortal germline and the soma that could potentially provide important insights into aging? August Weissman thought so. This was a German naturalist back in the 1800s who made this remark that death take, takes place because the capacity to renew itself is not uh, everlasting but finite. He was talking about somatic cells. And um, he coined the term, by the way, uh, immortal, uh, immortal cells. He used the term immortal to refer to cells that could replicate without limit. But you notice he's saying really two things. There's a repression of regeneration. A tissue cannot forever renew itself. And cell division is not everlasting but finite. Maybe I'm overly parsing Weissman's statement, but I don't think so. If you read his essay, he's quite aware of these distinction of these two different things. So what I'm summarizing here, a lot of biology which he discussed, is that there's this hierarchy of organisms, some very primitive multicellular animals um, don't age. Um, the protozoa, of course, don't have to age. They can, but they don't have to. Tetrahymena being an example of an immortal protozoan. Hydra, and then planaria, the worms there. And then you start seeing animals that can profoundly renew themselves, regenerate, like the Mexican salamander, but still then ages. And then you, so they cross this Weissman barrier. The whole organism goes off into this uh, non-renewable, non-immortal state. So, well, by the way, here in uh, humans, we pass the barrier for sure, the Weissman barrier defined by these two loss of these two characteristics of replicative immortality and the inability to regenerate. We lose them at around eight weeks post-fertilization. Uh, mice typically around 16, 18 days of embryonic development. So, you know, I think all of you know there's some animals that don't age. This is the hydra, for instance, um, uh, showing the no Gompertz curve, no evidence of aging. By the way, feel free to photograph the slides. It was mentioned that you need permission or whatever. You have my permission. What's interesting, an important clue, the Mexican salamander, maybe you've seen these animals, you, you cut their leg off and it'll just grow back. Almost perfectly, by the way. Not just some kind of nub, but a you know, profound regeneration. Not just in limbs, either. Um, I haven't done this experiment, but uh, those that have tell me that you can even re decerebrate a big part of the brain, and if you stuff flies down their throat, uh, they'll eventually learn to uh, recognize movement again and uh, swallow the fly on their own. The brain will regenerate. Really amazing. Why? Pedomorphosis. They're, they're stuck in an embryonic, or in this case, larval state due to a lack of thyroid hormone signaling. So they're sort of like an adult polywog. So now another concept. Uh, Williams proposed this idea of antagonistic pleiotropy, right? So he asked the question, why is it that we can do all this wonderful thing of morphogenesis and then we just can't maintain that which nature's built? And he proposed this concept that, okay, so maybe the way aging works is evolution selected for traits that benefit us early in life, but those same genes or alleles or traits uh, are a problem late in life. Antagonistic pleiotropy, it's called. So I'm going to combine these two concepts together. So if we combine them, what we would be looking for are mechanisms uh, or molecular changes that occur during the shift from the immortal germline to the soma and changes that reemerge in, let's say, cancer, if that's what nature is trying to prevent with these changes of aging, uh, then those would be priority targets for us to understand and potentially 
target with therapeutics, okay? Those are my assumptions. Agree or not? Those are my assumptions, okay. So what we've done, at, um, as I said, we've never discussed this publicly before, so I'm telling you for the first time. What we've been doing now for several years at AJAX is we, we, we pulled together a lot of biological materials spanning the whole spectrum of human development. So, of course, beginning with embryonic stem cells, uh, embryonic onlogin, so we made these from embryonic stem cells. These are very primitive embryonic lineages before the Weissman barrier would have been passed, okay, before eight weeks, all made in vitro. Fetal-derived cells. Now here we try to standardize it. We're always going to, the data I'll be showing you, we're, we're going to be looking always at uh, upper arm-derived skin fibroblasts, okay? And then we, we collected them all the way to old age, but into the 80s. Again, skin fibroblasts. So the data I'll show you there is skin fibroblasts. The developing mouse, of course, um, young and senescent cells, uh, a wide diversity of cancer cell lines to see, remember, we're looking for changes that may have re-emerged in cancer, um, premature aging uh, diseases like progeria, and then reprogramming. IPS cells, as you know, can reset the clock of aging all the way back to the beginning of life. And so we're looking at that. And then we're doing a wide array of protein and RNA and DNA-based assays. Uh, RNA, I'll be showing you a lot of RNA expression data but we've looked at the Acomus mouse, which is a regenerating mouse, can profoundly regenerate, sort of like a mammalian version of the salamander I showed you. Um, some proteomic data, metabolomic data, uh, seahorse-type oxygen consumption and things. Uh, the methylome, uh, chip seek for uh, epigenetic histone modifications, uh, high C looking at chromatin structure and interactions, and ATAC, which is sort of like the old DNA swan hypersensitivity assay. So what are we doing here? We're kind of looking at everything, covering the whole spectrum of human life and comparing it to known alterations that lead to accelerated aging or reversal of aging and so on. We've been doing this for years. And we haven't been talking about it because our instinct was it was damned important. So. So, what can you find if you do all this? Well, I'm just going to start by showing you a well-known example. Oh, you'll be hearing about it later today, telomeres and telomerase. So this is RNA sequencing data. On the left are the uh, embryonic stem cells. As you know, they're immortal, express telomerase very abundantly. But look at this. As soon as you make embryonic onlogin in the dish, um, in, within days and weeks, uh, there, there's, um, we've done thousands of these experiments. There's maybe, I don't know, 100 cell lines there, actually. No, no, actually, there's not. There's only about 20 or 30 in this one, this graph. But none of them express telomerase. They've already committed to replicative, immor uh, to replicative mortality that early. Uh, here's a, a, a lot of diverse somatic cell types, neurons, hepatocytes, you know, chondrocytes, all kinds of cells, no telomerase. Epithelial cells, no telomerase. But you can see the abundance of telomerase re-expressed in various cancer lines, as we published years ago. Um, this would meet that criteria, right, of antagonistic pleiotropy. Repressed in the soma, re-emerging in cancer, maybe that's nature's strategy. Okay. When we look at the skin fibroblast thing I told you about, um, there's ES cells again. Uh, you can see as soon as you, eight weeks, which is the tail end of embryonic development in skin, it's already off. Not detectable by RNA sequencing, any transcript. Uh, and then on the, on the right, 59-year-old, that's me, full disclosure, my skin fibroblast reprogram, and, you know, telomerase gets turned back on when you take cells back to the beginning of life by reprogramming. And um, I wasn't planning on using these cells on myself. It was just we needed a donor, and I donated. So that was just meant to be an example. What else can we find? 
Well, there's uh, genes that are involved in temporal development uh, that were discovered in C. elegans. Uh, small uh, RNAs that uh, are involved in the temporal development of C. elegans. They're like these genes that are altered in uh, the Mexican salamander. They control developmental timing. Remember I mentioned the Mexican salamander's pedomorphosis, so the heterochrony, it's a change in developmental timing. These genes were discovered in C. elegans as regulating developmental timing. Um, and I'm showing you some of the names, LIN41, LET7, LIN28, and so on. Uh, and that led to this whole microRNA field, really, some of those initial genes, LET7 being the second, I think, a, sm a small RNA, microRNA ever reported in the literature, Gary Rufkin's lab. Well, they're con highly conserved. So there I'm showing you some of our data, it matches pretty well to other published data in mouse development. Uh, so there are genes, these are genes that are involved in regulating the timing of development all the way from C. elegans through mouse and human, presumably. I haven't been able to find a lot of data on human, but I'm going to be showing you some in this presentation. So here is one of the early um, genes that were discovered in, in C. elegans, TRIM71. It looks like telomerase. On an embryonic stem cells, off right away, early in development, uh, and then reappearing in some cancers, not as profoundly as telomerase, but meeting this criteria. It's uh, involved in regulating some of the cyclin-dependent kinase, kinases and so, um, inhibitors, so um, may be important in the rapid proliferation of early embryonic uh, stem cells, for instance. Again, off in skin as early as eight weeks of embryonic development and re-expressed and reprogrammed, of course. Okay, two examples. So what uh, you would then say is that whereas the germline can repeat uh, the human species going forever and regenerating in a sense, we're regenerating humans forever, Somatic cells go through a restriction in, in potential, a developmental restriction or somatic restriction. And the first step that we see in our data occurs very early, such as, for instance, there's multiple genes here. I'm only showing you two, but one is the repression of telomerase catalytic component, another one being TRIM71. Okay, what else can we find? Um, here is a cluster of the expression of the LET7 genes, which I showed you come on during larval development of C. elegans and regulate developmental timing and are expressed in the mouse in the same way. Here in the same data set is expression of the, fam the cluster of the LET7 genes. I'll show you why I'm showing you the little cluster in a minute. However, LET7 does not meet that criteria, at least what we see. We do not see it being turned off transcriptionally in cancer. And then similar, here you can see during um, skin development, beginning at eight weeks, you can see it's starting to increase and then increases and then kind of once you uh, get the NT is the neonatal transition. After you're born, you can see it sort of levels off and of course is reset during reprogramming. Now, I mentioned if you, you can now look at the whole genome and all the chromatin and everything else. And so here um, is an IGV, or a, a view of the whole genome, and I'm looking here specifically at this uh, chromosome 22 locus. It's kind of complex because there's a lot of LET7 genes here and so on. But in the far left here at the top, I think you can see uh, the ATAC, the openness of the chromatin, at the top is um, uh, uh, embryonic vascular endothelium and then adult vascular endothelium. You can see the dark blue band, under, uh, the adult is blue. And then uh, we have uh, embryonic mesenchyme and adult MSCs. And you can see how it goes kind of a whitish to blue, whitish to blue. So what it's telling you is uh, this, these genes are opened in that locus in adult, okay? That's because this whole locus is being expressed. 
Uh, below that is the methylome, and you can see the opposite pattern. So the methylation of the DNA goes opposite. Uh, highly methylated sequences in this region correlate with closed DNA. So what we're seeing is epigenetic changes occurring um, at about the embryonic fetal transition here in this locus. Okay? What does match this antagonistic pleiotropy thing is LIN28B. LIN28B is a very important molecule. It's sort of a sponge that uh, binds LET7 and inactivates it. And um, you can see here that it's expressed very highly. By the way, it's one of the characterized reprogramming factors that could take an a aged cell all the way back to the beginning of life. You can see it's highly expressed in uh, pluripotent stem cells like ES cells. Uh, you can see it's expressed uh, at low levels in some of this embryonic onlogen, uh, but then shuts off in adult somatic cells and re-expressed profoundly in cancer. Uh, that's not our discovery. That's been in the literature for some time. It's really important driver, uh, we think, of, uh, of cancer. And it's difficult to see here, but in early... Uh, late embryonic, early fetal development, you can still see residual expression of this gene uh, even in skin fibroblasts. So it's just turning off right around eight weeks of uh, development when we start to lose, humans start to lose regenerative potential. Right around this time, human tissues can regenerate, like the salamander. You can cut the skin and it scarlessly regenerates. Uh, you can injure the spinal cord and it'll regenerate. So now we're looking at developmental changes that are shutting off regeneration. Also occurring around this time is not the expression of lamin A, but protein of a lamin A. So here in this published report, I'm showing you on the left of these little diagrams, looking at different types of tissues. Uh, you can see the detectability of lamin A in the mouse, and you can see it's it depends on tissue type, but it's, uh, you're seeing detectable lamin A at about the time of the embryonic fetal transition, uh, you know, E1618, for instance, in the skin. Uh, you see right here, the red bar in skin is right around uh, E16, right around that embryonic fetal transition. Why is that important? Well, of course, lamin A is the progeria gene, the gene that's mutated in progeria, and so we think it may be important. Uh, there's an embryonic counterpart, lamin B1, which is expressed abundantly in ES cells in early embryonic development. Um, but there's another reason. If you look at the regions of the genome that bind lamin A, if it's present, uh, it overlaps with LIN28B. So these blue lines um, are Philippe Colossus' uh, data on the uh, chip seq of uh, lamin A associated DNA and the, uh, the micrococonuclease versus sonicated preparations would tend to indicate that this locus is bound to the nuclear lamina uh, at points in development and we think may play an important role in repressing it. Repressing it allows let seven to make development proceed to the next step, which is primarily non-regenerative. And all of us have let seven, okay? So human development is similar to these other species, is my point. What else can we find? One of the early genes we reported uh, in collaboration with Encelico Medicine, actually, was the discovery of COX7A1. This is a component of complex four, and it's, um, as you can see, it's off in embryonic tissues, off in embryonic onlogen, turns on in adulthood, and uh, it is conspicuously absent in a lot of different cancers, which is really interesting to us because cancers tend to revert to an embryonic uh, met metabolic state. It's called the Warburg shift, and the expression of COX-71 seems to correlate with um, this oxidative versus glycolytic shift that occurs in embryonic development and goes back in cancer. 
Uh, you can see here in the expression of skin fibroblasts, it's often ESL starts coming on again at early embryonic skin development and then it reaches adulthood and then uh, is reset in reprogramming. So the next step in this restriction of somatic cells after repression of telomerase, we think, is a repression of regenerative potential. Uh, it's on in the salamander. It's on in planaria. You cut their head off, and they're immortal under the edge of the knife. Uh, it's off in you and me beginning right around eight weeks of our development in the, in the laboratory dish. What else can we find? Well, and now we're starting into areas where I think we could uh, bring together a lot of this data. Uh, there are species that can profoundly regress in their development. You may have heard there's, I thought it was clever, there's these articles about the immortal jellyfish. They weren't just referring to the fact that the cells can uh, regenerate and replicate indefinitely, but that the, they can regress. In the absence of food, they, they back up in their embryonic development and become a polyp again. Planaria do something similar. Uh, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And you feed them, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, it makes sense to us that mammals would have retained some of that. Right? We don't get smaller and smaller, but we do catabolize fat and muscle. In a lot of our evolutionary history of life on Earth, we were in feast famine scenarios, right? So nature allowed a certain amount of regeneration. So if we're in a, a tremendously dietary restricted uh, time, uh, we can catabolize tissues, but we need to be able to unlock regeneration a bit to build them back, right, when the food's available. And so the hypothesis is that dietary restriction derepresses regeneration, and that is why it's beneficial in uh, increasing lifespan, and that the repression of regeneration and telomerase are fundamentally important in the aging of the organism. A second bullet point here I'd point out is that we believe that this dietary restriction-induced regeneration is regulated in part by changes in chromatin, and in particular, the H3K27 acetylation or trimethylation, the polycomb-related complex. Um, and this, in, uh, all of this would explain in part uh, why NAD and sirtuins and mTOR and all these things do what they do. I'll just give you an example here. This is a component of the uh, polycomb repressive complex, EZH2. And here you can see how it is decreasing during uh, uh, human fetal development and levels off at about time of old age. And uh, Sadevi's lab has shown that it increases further. Uh, in, and I'm showing you here some of the uh, in vitro senescence data from our lab, consistent with his results, which is that increases even more uh, in senescence of cells. Um, it is uh, reported by Sadevi's lab that the repression of EZH2 uh, allows the expression of P16, an important break, emergency break on the cell cycle. And here you can see the expression of, of, of CDKN2A in, uh, in our data. Another thing, uh, Harmonizing a lot of this data was um, this idea of senescent cells are highly um, catabolic. They tend to you know, tear down tissue. And I'm showing you here some of the data in our, uh, our data base on the metalloproteinases, uh, collagenase and stromalysin and matrilysin. And these enzymes dis uh, degrade collagens and elastin. And just to kind of bring this down to, to uh, the ground state, uh, on the right is a picture of cutis laxa. The woman on the left is the daughter of the woman on the right, and she's uh, 16. Uh, I asked people blinded how old she was. Uh, I was going to ask uh, Alex Zavrinkov to have his do his AI analysis, and I just didn't have time. But uh, you can see the sagging skin, the premature aged appearance of skin. This is due entirely, this is not a progeria-like syndrome, this is due entirely just to the loss of elastin. And elastin is uh, uh, degraded by these metalloproteinases. So you see where I'm headed. So the 
uh, the uh, alterations in chromatin structure due in part to senescence and or metabolic changes can trigger the um, secretory phenotype of senescent cells. All this kicks in uh, as we ad uh, postnatal as we adapt to this dietary res uh, restriction scenario. There are further changes that we observe. Uh, as we reach adulthood, these are genes involved in the HIPPO pathway. This is the pathway that controls organ size and uh, growth and, and, and stature. And so we see those playing uh, out. But we do not see conspicuously changes late in life. All the profound changes we see in gene expression are occurring earlier in development. And it, like telomerase may be that many of the changes that lead to human aging are actually triggered earlier in life than you may have thought. So here are some of the pathways. You may re recognize some of the uh, components of this pathway and why they studied in aging. Well, what can we do about all this? As I mentioned, IPS reprogramming resets to can reset telomere length reset the epigenetic clock, the Horvath clock, reset cell lifespan. But if we reprogrammed all the cells in the soma with reprogramming technologies like this, we'd be a little puddle of embryonic stem cells. Some people are talking about partial reprogramming. Can we turn on these genes for a period of time? There's some concern about that, and it may cause cancer. Can we do a simple, precise, you know, surgical intervention and just turn on telomerase and ju just reactivate the regenerative pathways that we once had that were shut off at eight weeks of development after the human body was formed, right? We're not talking about de-differentiating a cell. That's what we call ITR, induced telomerase uh, and regeneration. And we've been, uh, based on our understanding of what some of these pathways are, been targeting uh, reagents to try to do this, and uh, Ajax 1547, uh, you can see here, resets this marker we very much like, COX7A1, back to, not to pluripotency, but back to this pre-embryonic fetal transition, and resets uh, what we think may be a modulator of apoptosis, one of the reasons aged somatic cells do not apoptose well. Um, this. Um, decoy receptor for uh, trail. And so the reason uh, we ourselves may not naturally undergo senolysis like they do in planaria and so on is that if your tissue can't regenerate, nature may be keeping your cells around because they can't re replace them. But if your tissues can regenerate, if you reinduce regeneration, uh, nature may naturally uh, cause the cells to undergo apoptosis and replace them as they do so effectively in these primitive immortal organisms. So in summary, uh, upstreaming early changes in developmental timing may play a fundamental role in aging uh, that you'd only discover by uh, looking very early in development. Small RNAs may be playing an important role in molecules that regulate their expression. Uh, induced peripotency appears to reverse the aging by many known criteria. Uh, the targeted re-expression of telomerase and regeneration may have important applications in regenerative medicine and then, of course, in uh, interventional gerontology. I love this quote. It's a classic textbook on regeneration. If there were no regeneration, there'd be no life because the species wouldn't perpetuate itself. If everything regenerated, there'd be no death. And hopefully someday we'll find out if that's a true statement. Thank you very much.